Hello everyone, and welcome to the 59th episode of Analyzing Evil, featuring Hans Gruber from Die Hard, a suave, sophisticated, and snide villain. The exceptionally talented person that was the late Alan Rickman gives this character life, his voice and mannerisms, shaping Hans into the legendary figure he is. And through Mr. Rickman, Hans is presented to us as one of the most dignified criminals ever to appear in cinema, a sharply dressed and casually brutal thief willing to do whatever it takes to provide for himself a life of luxury through crime. In this video, we're going to go scene by scene to examine every component What's of this man's plot and the mind that manufactured it, exploring every aspect of Hans to determine just exactly what kind of man he is. Now solving mysteries and crimes is best left to men like John McClane, but you can solve some of your own and have fun while you're at it from the comfort of your own home with our sponsor for this video, Hunt a Killer. Hunt a Killer is a company dedicated to providing you with interactive mysteries to solve akin to an escape room. My favorite type of mystery that Hunt a Killer offers is their subscription service, which signs you up for a six month long season where you'll receive a box of clues and documents to solve each month all leading up to a climactic finale when you solve the last component of this mystery. That's not all they offer though, and if subscription services aren't your thing, they also offer a number of standalone mysteries you can purchase whenever you like. These mysteries are a great activity to schedule with your friends or family, but they by no means require others to get started, and if you're a savvy noir detective who works alone, Hunt a Killer will keep you entertained for hours and years to come. And of course, it also makes a great gift for any true crime junkies in your circle. And just in time for the holidays, you can enjoy $10 off your purchase of any of Hunt a Killer's products by going to huntakiller.com slash thevioli and entering the code thevioli at checkout. So don't wait. Treat yourself or someone you know today with Hunt a Killer by going to huntakiller.com slash thevioli or by clicking the link down in the description. Thank you, Hunt a Killer, for sponsoring this video. Now, without further ado, let's take a dive into the mind of Hans Gruber. Hans doesn't have much of a backstory. He was classically educated and enjoyed building models when he was younger, but our knowledge of his upbringing is otherwise non-existent. At some point in his life, he joined up with a West German terrorist organization known as the Volksfrei Movement, whose motives are another unknown. But the name roughly translates to the Free the People Movement, so it's possible that this organization had something to do with the reunification of Germany, but that's something we'll likely never know. However, about halfway through the film, we learn that Hans was expelled from this organization some years ago, and the reason for that is also a mystery. It could be that he never really was an extremist and was simply in his business for the money, or perhaps he grew disillusioned with the organization and became a loose cannon. Whatever the case, as it stands at the time of this film, Hans is best described as a sophisticated thief masquerading as a terrorist in order to further his own plans. Though we aren't privy to this fact in the beginning of the film, this is evident from his introductory speech to the partygoers at the Nakatomi building, where Hans explains their mission as being one of revenge against a powerful corporation who's wronged the world and deserves their comeuppance. Here, well-groomed, calm, and clad in an expensive suit with a somber and serious visage, Hans professes his desire to give the higher echelon of the Nakatomi Corporation a lesson in real power, his words carrying a dramatic weight to them, his languid voice instilling a sense of dread in the crowd before him, showing us that Hans is well-versed in the art of intimidation, as he uses body language, careful wording, and precise speech patterns designed to project a menacing, no-nonsense aura towards his victims. To emphasize the dire situation these people are in, Hans walks around the room at a steady pace, increasing the level of anxiety in each of these people as he attempts to coax the information he needs out of them. In stark contrast to this particular method of intimidation, we find Hans adopting a casual persona once he's alone with Mr. Takagi, singing a tune and complimenting his suit as they ascend the building. These dual personas are very much in line with the notion that Hans isn't committing this crime for any sort of perceived noble cause, and this switch is meant to show us that his menacing speech and threatening actions are no more than a tool, a means to an end, and Hans could care less about any cause other than his own desire to line his pockets. Hans championing a noble cause may be a ruse, but his proclamation that the people of the Nakatomi Corporation would be witnesses to a display of real power certainly wasn't, and the severity of this statement is put into action in much the same way that Hans conducts himself between people when he's not putting on a show with casualness as when Mr. Takagi insists that he doesn't know the codes for the computer 
Hans executes him without so much as flinching, highlighting for us how merciless this man is in pursuit of his desires. Speaking of desires, in the next scene where Hans sets his eyes on the vault for the first time, we see a sort of longing overtake him as he stands there mesmerized by this steel capsule, a capsule that holds within it the wealth he needs to set him up for the rest of his life. This is undoubtedly something that Hans has been working on for quite some time, as this plan is quite brilliant, the components of which we'll be covering more as we go along. And as he comments in the next scene, they've left nothing up to chance, making this a meticulous plot that this man has dreamed of bringing to fruition for months or even years. And to see the fruit of his desire so close to being within his grasp leaves him with a moment of exaltation that blocks out all other thoughts. Again, because his plan is so well thought out, Hans is quite calm and confident, and he remains so throughout this entire endeavor, even when he's presented with a snag in his plan, the first of which presents itself when John pulls a fire alarm. Here, Hans doesn't panic. He simply radios his man at the guard post to phone the police and give them the dead guard's credentials in order to shut off the alarm. Following this moment, he returns to the partygoers and addresses them with a mixture of the casualness he displays in regular conversation, the disappointment he feels at Mr. Takagi for withholding information, and the seriousness he conveyed during his introduction, sitting nonchalantly on a table as he eats a pastry, informing these people of their boss's death, and that a similar fate awaits them should they choose to defy him, a moment that displays Han's dry and dark sense of humor. This act is similar to his initial speech, in that he's trying to instill fear into these people, by using clever mind games, prodding at the defenses of the weakest link among them in an attempt to earn some cooperation from his victims. And it once again emphasizes the cunning of Hans Gruber, a man intimately familiar with the inner workings of the human mind and human emotion. However, Hans isn't totally immune to his own emotions getting out of control, as we see when his anger flared at Mr. Takagi, when Carl is enraged and threatening to endanger their plan in order to get his revenge on John, and when he hears John radioing the police from the top of the building. But these are only minor incidents, and his anger isn't overwhelming by any means. Rather, it's used in order to fulfill a purpose in that moment, making it more of a tool that Hans uses when necessary than a detrimental trait inherent to his character. Even when John begins to taunt him over the radio, Hans manages to stay calm, silencing his touchy compatriots as they seethe over this one-man army killing their comrades and ruining their plans. But not Hans. Hans's mind is pointed at his mission, and though an obstacle in the form of John has appeared on the road to that mission, it's but an inconvenience, and Hans' intelligence and confidence in his own ability to see his mission through make it so these japes have no effect on him, and he uses this moment to turn John's attempts at breaking his mental fortitude to his advantage by attempting to gather intel from him. Even when presented with an annoyance turned boon in the form of Ellis, the idiotic man-child, in the next scene, Hans uses Ellis to ascertain John's name in order to instill some fear in him, and promptly executes Ellis once his use has run its course, burdening John with the thought that if he doesn't give up on his pursuit of Hans and his men, that there will be more death to come. After killing Ellis, and leaving Holly's office to go and check the explosives, we come in contact with a crucial aspect of Hans that we've already experienced, to a lesser degree, a few times in this film, his resourcefulness. As upon running into John, Hans uses his quick wit to outsmart John, fooling him into believing that he's one of the employees of the Nakatomi Corporation by putting on a very convincing accent. Now considering John outsmarts him soon after this moment, it would seem that Hans didn't fool John at all. It's true, it could be that John knew who Hans was all along. However, I don't believe that's the case, and I think Hans did fool John. But considering who John is, and the ordeal that he's been put through, he isn't a man who would blindly trust another in this scenario, no matter how convincing. And handing Hans an unloaded gun was a hunch, a test of the validity of his person, and not necessarily an indicator that John knew Hans was lying the entire time. After retrieving the detonators, Hans puts into action the most brilliant part of his plan, tricking the FBI into cutting the power to the building in order to lower the last lock on the vault. And the reason the FBI do this is because they believe the threat they're facing is a terrorist one. And this is the course of action that they follow in these scenarios, which Hans was well aware of. Obviously masquerading as a terrorist group, plotting to bring justice to a corrupt corporation and free their comrades while they were at it had its advantages. 
as if the authorities had known it was a robbery, they would have likely treated this situation much differently. And if Hans hadn't requested the release of his so-called comrades, Theo wouldn't have had enough time to hack into the vault, which emphasizes the fact that Hans didn't put on this show simply for the final lock on the vault. But it certainly was the most crucial part of fooling the police and the FBI into believing they were terrorists. As if they hadn't, it's likely that they would have never been able to open that last lock, and their plan would have been for nothing. When the vault opens, we once again find Hans mesmerized like a kid on Christmas morning staring at all the presents under the tree. As before him, lies everything he had desired, just waiting for him to open it, with a ride out, guaranteed to him, by the FBI, waiting to take him to safety. However, like almost every component of Han's plan, that request was nothing more than deception, and his true intent is to herd his hostages to the roof and blow it to oblivion, killing every one of these people, as well as the men coming to rescue them, providing for himself and his comrades a distraction and an alibi through a mass amount of mayhem and bloodshed, showing us again that this man is nothing more than a selfish, greedy, cold-blooded killer, one who's willing to harm anyone in order to get what he wants, an exceptional thief and a ruthless murderer. In the end, all of his planning, the perfection that is his plot, is ruined by one man with the skills and the drive to bring him down. A Christmas miracle in the form of one John McLean, the man who sends our dapper German burglar hurtling towards his untimely end. And at this end, who was Hans Gruber? He was a highly intelligent terrorist turned thief, one who was a skilled manipulator and a talented strategist, a man who sought to kill, maim, and steal in order to provide a better position for himself in the world. During the course of this film, we find Hans directly responsible for the deaths of two innocent men, and if he had gotten his way, he would have added dozens of innocent lives to his kill count. It's unknown how many people Hans may have killed before he decided to pull this heist, but it's safe to say that Hans is no stranger to murder, and he has no qualms about harming others as long as there's something in it for him. Cold, cruel, casual, and selfish to the core, Hans Gruber is a magnificent villain, one that hypnotizes us with his sophistication and quiet bravado, a stylish man who impresses us with his demeanor and sickens us with his actions, a man who would sow discord and death for his own well-being, committing crimes and killing others for no better reason than to give himself a better life, for no other reason than to provide himself with an immense amount of luxury, a man who, when it comes down to it, is nothing more than an agent of evil. Thank you all for tuning in to this episode of Analyzing Evil, and I hope you've enjoyed. What are your thoughts on Hans? Did I miss anything? Let me know down below, and leave a suggestion for a villain you'd like to see featured in a future episode while you're at it. If you like this video, hit that thumbs up button, and make sure to subscribe if you haven't already. A big thank you to all of my subscribers, and to my patrons, and a most vile thank you to those whose names you're seeing on screen now. Join the channel's Discord server and Reddit to interact with myself and the community, and follow me on the social media platforms listed below to keep up with the channel. As always, thanks for watching, and I'll be seeing you soon.